My dear young sisters and brothers, Lisa and I are so happy to welcome you to this worldwide devotional for young adults. As we begin, we bring you the sincere, warm greetings of President Russell M. Nelson and the First Presidency. They love you, and we love you, and together we honor and sustain them. Now we join with you from a very unique and special place in our history as Latter-day Saints. And I do mean place. We're here at the newly dedicated Pioneer Center, next to the monument at This Is The Place Heritage Park in the foothills above Salt Lake City, Utah. The place that celebrates that far-reaching declaration by President Brigham Young. This is the place following their arduous trek with the first pioneer party nearly 175 years ago. Worn and tattered, these early Latter-day Saints fled from fierce persecution to settle here in this wilderness valley. Imagine the image of the Salt Lake Valley that awaited them. The wide open desert space with rolling sagebrush provided proof that settling here was not going to be easy. However, they were blessed with an incomprehensible heavenly vision, supported by the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah that the Lord would lift up an ensign for the nations. These faithful saints would once again know peace and purpose with an elevated gospel vision far higher than the mountaintops they climbed to reach the Salt Lake Valley. These pioneers and those that came afterward would make history, carving out this place in the desert. God blessed them as the gathering of the hat of Israel had begun. Even today, that same pioneer spirit and vision can be found in Latter-day Saints everywhere in the world. Just a few weeks ago, M. Russell Ballard, acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, dedicated this new pioneer center. Here, people and families could come and absorb the monumental achievements of early Latter-day Saints in the face of rigid hardships. The odds were stacked against them. The pioneers called upon the Lord day and night as they forged ahead to grow food, steer water out of the mountain canyons, build homes and shelters, schools and meeting houses, and even a temple. It's almost too much to contemplate what they did. Divine vision instilled by the Lord upon living prophets, blessing the lives of his elect children to bring about his purpose. As you can see, just a few feet from where, from where I'm standing here at the Pioneer Center is the vaulted glass that overlooks the monument of this is the place. And below that, we have a sparkling glimpse of a city that they started building so long ago. And beyond that, you have a wide view, a vision, if you will, that looks to the west and the horizon of the setting sun. This elevated view, coupled with our understanding of the past, expands and informs our perspective of the vision of the pioneers. It can also serve as a metaphor to help deepen our personal gospel vision and guide us as we face decisions and challenges in our lives. Within days of the prophet's declaration, this is the place, the vision for a temple church headquarters and a place to become an ensign to the nations began its initial steps, becoming a reality. So, this evening we'll use the past the vision of our pioneer forebears to help us get a clarity of, clarity of vision for our future. Winston Churchill's inspiring words seem especially relevant for our conversation tonight. The farther backward you can look, the farther forward you can see. There's no question we face uncertainty in the world. After nearly a year and a half of an unprecedented pandemic, what lies ahead? Each of us require the same divine vision and heavenly guidance experienced by those early saints as we look towards our future. You might feel unsure of which direction to go. You could be holding on tightly to dreams of serving a mission, getting an education, of launching a career, 
Or you could be thinking about falling in love, getting married and having a family and, and seeing the blessings of the temple come to you and your loved ones. Or perhaps you have started your eternal family and are now experiencing the challenges of raising young children. Our ultimate goal is the same, to progress along the covenant path, faithfully preparing for exaltation. A gospel perspective provides a vision for you and me to see clearly that path. When speaking about staying on the covenant path, President Nelson has said, the key is to make and keep sacred covenants. We choose to live and progress on the Lord's covenant path and to stay on it. It is not a complicated way. It is the way to true joy in this life and eternal life beyond. And so our hope is to share with you a few of our own personal experiences that may offer guidance as you navigate all the demands in your life to assist you in going forward with vision and balance. vision statement from the early pioneers, their vision that all is well in the midst of challenges and afflictions was possible because of their gospel perspective. We could spend an hour speaking about vision, which some characterize as 
the art of seeing things invisible to others. This leads to a question that you all that you will all ask yourself at one time or another. What do I currently see for myself in the years ahead? Where have I been and where am I going? Sometimes we just need to realize that with a gospel perspective and the gift of the Holy Ghost, we have a greater vision of what is possible. Such is the case as you have launched yourself into your current educational or professional endeavors, even though you are still likely feeling your way. Now, I found myself in this place in my early professional career. I began my professional life with a childhood friend starting a business as university students, importing giftware from Asia. Over the next 30 years, our enterprise changed completely and grew significantly in scale. A question often asked of us was, when you started your business, was this in your vision? Well, the short answer is not completely. You see, vision needs to be adjusted regularly and routinely, starting as a small importer of brass giftware and then growing to become a large provider of fitness products required a lot of luck and adjustment to our vision in between. And so abandoning and creating a new plan, reinvention and adjustment is really a strength, not a weakness. However, this is where we point out the significant advantage we share in finding our vision. Because you have a knowledge of the gospel, just like the pioneers, you are blessed with a gospel perspective. Your advantage is to see your mortal journey with a view that is literally heavenly. An eternal or gospel perspective provides helpful clarity that others do not enjoy even in temporal matters of education and profession. We'd like to attempt to demonstrate this with images rather than words. So we ask you to look at this picture. Now, what do you see? Do you know what this image portrays? Now, does this new perspective help give you clarity? Is this all there is to see? What do you think? Let's take a look at the sequence as it unfolds, so watch closely. Now, through this simple exercise, you can see quite literally beyond what is right in front of you at the moment. Your vision is enhanced the further out you go. A wise and familiar adage in Proverbs states, where there is no vision, the people perish. This true principle was further described in our day by President M. Russell Ballard when he said, Those who accomplish the most in this world are those with a vision for their lives. How true that is. Our spiritual vision, which comes from our gospel perspective, provides insight to all of life's priorities. It allows us to align those priorities and keep them properly balanced. This is why we see a very close connection between vision and balance. I'd like to share you the principle of balance by relating a personal experience that I had. 
A friend of mine, renowned in his profession, also happened to be a skilled and experienced helicopter pilot. On a warm fall day, he called and told us he was flying to Salt Lake City and asked my business partner and I if we'd like to be dropped off at a mountain property en route. Well, to get there by truck would take over two hours. By helicopter, it would only take us 15 minutes. So we decided to go. It was a beautiful day to be flying. We could see the colors of the fall leaves as we began to land. We were less than a minute from touching down when the tail rotor of the helicopter malfunctioned. <clears throat> this sent the helicopter into an uncontrolled spin. These were dire circumstances. Fortunately for us, the pilot's training in emergency landing protocol was almost instinctive to him. He knew if we landed nose first or on the helicopter's belly, we would not survive the landing. In the midst of the uncontrolled spinning, he skillfully turned the helicopter on its side and we crashed to the ground. Fuel was leaking and fire was coming from the engine, but he was able to turn off the engine and we were able to exit the helicopter without explosion. Through this pilot's actions and the hand of the Lord, we were blessed to survive the helicopter crash. <clears throat> now, I've learned a lot about helicopters since that day. Our experience of the helicopter crash was the outcome of a tail rotor malfunction, which created imbalance between the, hel the critical elements that keep the helicopter in the air. When balance is achieved among the speed of the main rotor, the tail rotor, and angle, helicopter flight can be exhilarating. If not, it's terrifying. And I can personally testify of that. So let's take a moment to break down these critical elements in greater detail. The first is the main rotor. Revolutions and blade create lift and torque. However, torque created by the main rotor must somehow be offset or the helicopter will spin out of control. That is why a helicopter has a tail rotor. It creates opposition against the torque created by the overhead blades. Then speed is controlled by the pilot through a hand control. The tail rotor speed is controlled by the pilot's feet. Constant adjustment to the speed of these two rotors is absolutely necessary. If not, once again, the outcome is not a good one. <clears throat> okay, now next is the stick. The stick controls the angle of the helicopter, which in turn controls the helicopter's direction, turning ability, and stability working in concert with the main rotor and the tail rotor. The pilot operates the stick with his right hand. Finally, the weight of the payload and angle of the helicopter determines speed and power required to the main rotor and the tail rotor. When all of these elements are in sync, the balance is beautiful. Main rotor, tail rotor, stick, weight, and angle. It literally defies gravity. How can we relate the beautiful yet complicated flight of a helicopter to having balance in our lives? Well, let me introduce some thoughts inspired by a message given by President Gordon B. Hinckley in a leadership conference I once attended many years ago. It will maybe create this connection for you. He described that each of us have a fourfold responsibility. First, we have a responsibility to our families. Second, we have a responsibility to our employers. Third, we have a responsibility to the Lord's work. And fourth, we have a responsibility to ourselves. So using the same analogy of balance through 
interdependence of critical elements of a helicopter, let's look at these four responsibilities in the same way. Okay. We begin with home and family, critical elements in each of our lives. It is important that you not neglect the family you belong to. Nothing you have is more precious. It is the family relationship which you will take into the life beyond. Much has been done in recent years by church leaders to emphasize the importance of home and families. Recent guidance with, with respect to the new balance between gospel instruction in the home and church and the adjusted meeting schedule are a great indication that home and family should be considered the main rotor in our lives. President Nelson challenged us to diligently work to remodel our homes into a center of gospel learning. As we do, he promised that over time, your Sabbath days will truly be a delight. Your children will be excited to learn and to live the Savior's teachings, and the influence of the adversary in your life and in your home will decrease. Changes in your family will be dramatic and sustaining. Okay, next let's consider then your work or professional life, your employment, or if you're a student, the education you're seeking, which will lead to your full-time profession or employment. Education, of course, enhances your employability. Work allows you to care for yourself, your family, and others. Employment leads to self-reliance, both temporal and spiritual. In your work environment, you have an obligation to your employer to be honest and loyal, to provide the expected results for which you're compensated. You strive to be your very best in your job or, prof or profession. For illustration, consider employment as the tail rotor of the helicopter. In order to be the best for you and your family, it helps to be the best at your job. Both are linked together closely, and balance between the two is critical. More and more employers, sociologists, and business consultants are recognizing the benefits of work-life balance. The third critical life balance element is to the Lord and His work. This is one of the main purposes of why we each came to earth. We are here to love, honor, obey, and serve Him and our Heavenly Father's children, our brothers and sisters throughout the world. The Lord needs our efforts and talents to build his kingdom. So budget your time to take care of your church responsibilities. Now, I find budget to be rather instructive, this word. It requires a constant choice for us to both make time for service to the Lord and his church and to regulate that time. Lay leadership and service are two of the distinguishing elements of the Restored Church of Jesus Christ. Each of you will be asked to contribute to the kingdom in various ways. The calls which come to you and others in your family may come at times which may not seem convenient. Nevertheless, if you have desires to serve God, ye are called to the work. Additionally, our dear prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, taught us that our world is ever-changing, as is our service in the Lord's Church. He encouraged us to embrace a new normal. He challenged us to minister to others, keep an eternal perspective, and magnify our callings. So this encouragement gives each of us vision to do what we have been called to do but also advises us to keep an eternal perspective, or in other words, to balance it with our other pressing responsibilities. I think of church service as the stick of the helicopter, which both stabilizes and steers us. The final element to assure balance is the obligation to ourselves. Life can be so busy. It is important that we slow down at times to recharge and take a closer look at our own personal needs, like rest, exercise, recreation, and personal spiritual development. Church leaders have recently given valuable and practical suggestions to help us do this. 
Yes, they have, Lisa. Recently, President M. Russell Ballard suggested how important it is to find quiet time. He said, quote, while technology has often been a blessing in my life, it can also be a distraction that places a barrier between us and our ability to hear the Lord's voice. I tell my grandchildren they should set aside quiet time each day to think about their lives and ponder what the Lord wants them to do. I cannot connect with heaven in a massive clutter. When I am in a quiet mode and striving to be still, that's when I get impressions. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland speaks of determined prayer. He said this, there is a great lesson in urgent, determined prayer to fight through the adversary's opposition, the cares of the day, or the distractions of our mind. Sister Jean Bingham, Relief Society General President, described three elements to help ourselves that are each very valuable. First, she invites the Spirit through the Scriptures. She says, one of the first things I do in the morning in order to have the Spirit is read the Scriptures. It helps me have the right frame of mind so that I can receive revelation. Her second element is temple worship. Another marvelous way to be able to hear the Savior's voice. More, it comes to me more clearly as attending the temple. Sometimes when I am sitting in the temple, I will receive an answer to a prayer. Or something will come to mind while I am sitting enough to listen to the Spirit. Third, she says, music helps me hear the voice of the Savior. I love hearing the hymns, even if I just hear instrumental music without the words. I know those words because I have sung, sung them for so long, so they come to my mind. It seems to me that taking time for ourselves is often the most difficult, and yet it is very important. I've heard it described as pausing long enough in the busy work of sawing to sharpen the saw blade. Remembering we have responsibility to ourselves and integrity that step by step into our lives will be a blessing. I have found that as I develop myself physically, emotionally, and spiritually, not only does it bring a great benefit to me personally, but it allows me to nourish my family and friends. Look how smoothly these four fa facets of our lives run, if executed with vision and balance. They go together so well, don't they? They really do. Now, even as we speak about balance in these different aspects of our lives, we need to even put this in the right perspective. Elder Bednar summarized this in a very pragmatic way in a recent social media post. He said, quote, Sometimes we reflect on all of our responsibilities at home, school, work, and church and wonder how we can achieve a balance among the many competing demands of our time. Instead of driving ourselves crazy trying to do everything at the same time, we should identify the few fundamental things that are our highest priorities. We can then strive to give each of them the attention they need one at a time. Lisa, this reminds me of a very memorable experience with my father. I was a young father, a newly called bishop, with a demanding, growing business. One night I walked in late to a family birthday party. Our children and their cousins were all over the place. But I walked into the house, disengaged, and went and sat in the corner of the room, laboring over my worries of the business affairs of that day and what was happening in the ward. My father came over to me in an uncharacteristically stern voice and said, Gary, what are you doing? Well, when I told him of all my worries with all my responsibilities at church and work, I was certain he'd be very sympathetic. Well, he wasn't. In fact, he sat down next to me and told me he was worried about me 
and that I needed to make some adjustments so I wasn't so disengaged with my family when I was with them. Do you remember this, Lisa? I remember it very well. He said, when you're at home, make home the priority, not church and work. When you're at work, choose to make work the priority, not home and church. When you're at church, choose to make that the priority, not work and home. Now, this council was challenging to integrate, and even now I'm far from perfect, but it really helped me. It unburdened me, and it has paid great dividends in my life. So I would invite each of you to think about this and try to do it yourselves. Interestingly, this is almost exactly what Elder Bednar counseled in the social media post that we referred to. He shared, to finish that, it may sound simplistic, but we should not get frustrated and waste effort and time trying to achieve a perfect equilibrium among all of the important things we need to do. As we pray sincerely for God's help to identify what matters most, he will guide and assist us to focus our efforts day by day. Well, now I have a bit of bad news to share. If you follow this counsel and move forward with balance and vision, you will most likely still have a few failures. You're going to take a few scrapes and bruises. There may be times when your vision seems obscured by a foggy path, or you may lose your balance. But here is the good news. You are sons and daughters of a loving Heavenly Father. The scriptures teach us, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of a sound mind. And don't forget this important counsel from the Lord himself. Wherefore, be of good cheer, and do not fear. For I, the Lord, am with you, and will stand by you. And so you have a constant divine source of strength in our beloved Savior, even Jesus Christ. Now listen to the inspired encouragement for each of you here today from President Nelson. He said, quote, God knew the covenant path would not be easy to find or to stay on. So he sent his only begotten son to atone for us, to show us the way. The godly power available to all who love and follow Jesus Christ is the power to heal us, strengthen us, cleanse us from sin, and magnify us to do the things we could never do on our own, close quote. Let the knowledge of who you are and who is on your side help you live your life with clear vision and and steady balance. The Lord will increase your opportunities, expand your vision, and strengthen you. Well, it's been wonderful to be with you tonight. And we'd like to close now by expressing our gratitude and extending an invitation to each of you and offering our testimonies. I invite you to first consider how your gospel vision assures and confirms your identity as a daughter of God and a son of God. Second, consider how you address your your fourfold responsibility to home and family, to education and employment, to the church, and to yourself. Now third, I invite you to find a quiet place and write down some impressions that you have felt during this devotional. Remember, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, each of you are gifted. Gifted with the companionship of the Holy Ghost. As you act on the invitations from Elder Stevenson, don't forget about the pioneers that came before us. Those who we spoke of who settled this valley as well as those in each of your respective families and home countries. Their pioneer spirit, an example of doing hard things, can give you the confidence to do hard things as well. So like the early Latter-day Saints, we look out, we look up, and we look within. 
for gospel vision and balance. I offer my testimony that you can obtain that perfect brightness of hope that Heavenly Father knows each of you by name and that he loves you. I offer my witness of Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of the living God. And I do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lisa. I offer my testimony and witness as well to you, our young, beautiful brothers and sisters. I bear my testimony that we are children of loving heavenly parents. That Heavenly Father loves you. And the doctrine of the Father is that He desires all of His children to return to Him. Now, this doctrine is enabled by His Son, our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. It is through His atonement that we are able to return to the presence of of our loving Heavenly Father. I offer my witness of that to you. I offer my testimony of Jesus Christ and of His sacred role as our Savior and our Redeemer. And I do that in His name, Jesus Christ. Amen.